This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Woodland and Forest Health for Landowners in the Lower Midwest with Robbie Deerhoff. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement um, for the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar today. Uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, and at the end, Carol will come on to read those out to Robbie. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. A link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with any resources mentioned during the presentation. So to introduce today's speaker, Robbie Deerhoff is the forest entomologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, she received both her bachelor's and master's degrees in biology from Truman State University, studying Belizean katydids for her thesis. Uh, she is originally from a farm in Lawrence County, but enjoys living north of Columbia with her husband and sons. So without further ado, take it away, Robbie. All right, thank you, Brooke. I really appreciate that introduction. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in today. Um, I look forward to speaking with you about, let's see if we can get a slide to advance. about woodland and forest health, um, specifically for those of you that live in the lower Midwest. Um, so that's gonna include trees that are, are growing in this um, central region, basically. So the central hardwoods region. So when I say forest, when I say tree, when I say woodland, um, know that I'm not trying to be very specific on the actual habitat type that I'm talking about. I just wanna cover what stresses trees and, and eventually what will stress woodlands and, and forest ecosystems as a whole if those trees are stressed. So please don't let me um, put you off by the use of woodland, forest, or tree. Know that for today's purposes, those are, are largely interchangeable. All right, so I wanna start out by showing you an aerial image of a forest um, in, in Southwest Missouri. This is actually where I grew up uh, in Lawrence County and there's some issues here. And I think a lot of you can probably relate to this. Uh, maybe you're a newer landowner, maybe you have land in your family that um, you may be responsible for at some point or, or now. Uh, maybe there's several of you that are responsible for the same land and you have conflicting ideas. But the starting point is, is usually this for a lot of, of landowners in the lower Midwest. Typically, there's not been any management that's been done on the forest or um, what management was done was probably not very good. Maybe it was a, a logging operation a number of years ago where they came in, they took the best trees and just left the rest. Um, typically, there's some heavy forest grazing that has gone on at some point, maybe not currently, but do realize that 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 forest grazing history can really impact forests and woodlands for a long period of time, for many years after the fact. Oftentimes there's a high stand density, some overstocking that's going on if trees have not been properly managed. And um, there's, in general, in this part of the world, we tend to have a lot of red oak group species. So um, Southern red, Northern red, pin oak, black oak, and a lot of those species, as they start to mature and become over mature, they just, they don't live all that long. Um, and we'll talk about that just a little bit more in the future. So in general, this type of setting leads to, to no oak regeneration, or at least very little. Um, and when you're talking about trees that are growing on shallow, rocky soil anyway, uh, you really it's not good when you don't have any regeneration coming in behind these overmature um, black oaks. So in this particular situation, there was severe ice damage in 2007. Many of you probably remember that ice storm and this was sort of the center of it in Missouri. Really bad, it was about an inch and a half of ice in this location and it led to a lot of tree damage that ultimately led to a lot of tree death. And then five years later, there was the severe drought of 2012. There are some cedars that are encroaching and some cedars that will really enjoy taking the spot of some of those big black oaks after they die. 
um, and some invasive plants, but largely that's not a, a huge issue on this property, although it is becoming more and more of an issue across the board um, in our central hardwoods. So overall, while there's no actual forest health index that's been created by us humans, I would say in my professional opinion, this is largely an unhealthy forest and one that could really use some, some human intervention, some management uh, to make it more healthy in the future. So let's talk about what affects tree forest woodland health. There's a number of things, okay? It's, it's, it's pretty complicated. And in some places there's um, more than one thing. Sometimes there's only one thing, but it just, it, it's often a complex of issues that come together to affect the health of, of one of these, um, of a forest or woodland. So at the landscape level, we're looking at things like storm damage, drought, maybe a late frost, but then you have to bring in some other things too that tend to be more specific to your particular location. Um, and those can be anything from, you know, high stocking levels, even slope position. Uh, if you're in sort of a hilly area, uh, compaction, typically this is caused by humans or maybe do domestic animals, um, erosion, age of trees, the soil type that these trees are growing in. Some of these we have control over, some of them we don't, okay? And then comes in the other things uh, that, that tend to hit stress trees or, or weaken trees. And, and that's often our native borers and our um, foliage eaters, our defoliators, uh, fungal diseases. And then of course, there's that big scary category of invasive species, which can encompass lots of different things. And to make matters more complicated, there's about 900 other things that you could consider as problematic for individual trees and, and forests and woodlands as a whole. So let's talk about tree stress now, because we humans aren't the only ones that feel stress. Trees certainly feel some stress. It may not be the same as what we deal with, but they're definitely being stressed um, by a lot of different con conditions, both abiotic and biotic. So let's review what abiotic is. These are the non-living things that can affect all the trees in an area, not just one specific species usually. Um, think drought or, or widespread um, late season freeze. These conditions are often what makes trees more susceptible to the living pests, the biotic things. And often it's these abiotic conditions that initiate decline and death, eventual death in, in trees. The biotic issues on the other hand are those living things, you know, the insect and disease. And in a lot of cases, especially when you're dealing with native pests and pathogens, their, their goal, their role in the ecosystem is to be recyclers, to, to contribute to the death of that tree and then take it down to the forest floor and start that recycling process. So they're mostly attacking uh, weak or stressed trees. In a lot of cases, they're very species specific. So for example, one insect borer may only attack oaks. It may not be found in um, ash trees that are, are declining or dying. Uh, but there are a, a wide range of um, especially fungal pathogens, decay pathogens, um, decay species that will act as generalists and will attack several different kinds of tree species. And unfortunately, it's these biotic issues that are often what people blame for tree death because they're a whole lot more visible. Um, and it's, it's easier to identify a mushroom growing on a tree or an insect that came out of a tree than it is to think back to the history of that forest or those trees and, and what may have led to the weakening and the stress that eventually led to the invasion by the pests and pathogens. So if you're a visual learner like I am, you probably wanna see this a little bit more clearly. Here's an illustration that shows uh, those mature trees, um, how these predisposing stresses such as drought, these abiotic things, then sort of kick them down and make them a bit more susceptible to, um, you know, these, these biotic pests and pathogens. And with additional stress, you know, maybe another event, some kind of widespread weather event, or maybe something like construction compaction, 
um, or some sort of root issue, these trees are then just sent even further down that decline spiral. And so you get to the point where declining, dying trees are, are what the end result is. All right, so let's review those abiotic issues just a little bit more um, intensely. So the first one is drought. We all know what drought is. We've all experienced drought in the last 10 years here in the lower Midwest, um, particularly in Missouri, we've had some really droughty periods. We've also had some periods of flooding, which that flooding isn't quite that landscape scale. It's, it's obviously going to be restricted to areas more riparian in nature. But this idea of excess rainfall, where we get five or seven inches of rain in just the course of 24 hours or less, this is becoming more widespread and more common and obviously isn't just restricted to a riparian area. More on that in just a minute. Late season frosts, while they tend to be patchy, they are pretty landscape scale. Um, and storm damage, same thing. It can be patchy, but it often affects a pretty widespread area. And storm can be uh, anything from ice and, and wind to something like this photo, which this is an early summer hail storm that caused a lot of leaf injury and loss on these oaks right here. And then of course, another abiotic issue that we really don't have any control over um, and, and can't change would be the rocky and typically thin, what a lot of people would call poor soils that are common in this part of the world. Um, and, and oaks actually do fairly well on these soils, but you know, this is something to consider because a lot of these soils are only so productive. Um, they can only help trees to achieve um, so much growth in their lifetime. So here's a picture that I took this past spring back in 2021 of a late spring frost that affected the southern half of Missouri and probably down into, you know, northern Arkansas, maybe a little bit over into Oklahoma and Kansas. Um, I couldn't tell from the remote sensing how widespread this was. I just knew through, through my driving around the southern half of the state that all of southern Missouri had patches of, of frost damage because our trees were fairly well leafed out um, when this occurred about the third week of April. And in the valleys especially, we had a lot of leaves that were, were frosted pretty hard. Um, so some trees were even half frosted and, and half not frosted. Um, which is, you know, that's, that's better than being totally frosted, I guess. But these trees that have to put on an entirely new set of leaves right out of the gate in early spring, that's really, really hard on them. It's very stressful. They should be using that first set of leaves to do photosynthesis and, and make um, food and starch and carbs, but instead they're trying to grow a new set of leaves. So that's, that's just a problem. Another thing I wanna visit in a little bit more detail before we move on is this idea of, of these drought cycles and these really excessively wet periods. And so here, particularly in Missouri, um, we have been going through for about the last five years, periods where we'll, we'll be very dry. And then that is broken by excessive rainfall, not just, oh, a couple inches in 24 hours or, or whatever, a soaking rain but an intense five to seven inch rainfall where a lot of it runs off um, or we get a lot of saturated, overly saturated soils that, that can be very problematic for tree roots. So we've been going from really dry to really wet. And if you look at these maps, you can see it's obvious to understand um, the, the drought issue there. That red in the Southern part of the state is the more intense drought, but even that yellow is abnormally dry. And then when you're looking at this um, precipitation departure, this is showing that in much of the state for the, the first half basically of 2021, we were ahead on rainfall. And actually we ended 2021 in Missouri ahead in a lot of places by several inches um, when it comes to, to rainfall. But in October of 2021 in Missouri, we are back to drought conditions. So, what I'm trying to make sense of for you here is that that we've we've been going very violently from one end of the pendulum to to the other, from wet to dry, 
Um, and it, it's just, it's really hard on tree roots. I live in the middle part of the state in Boone County where it says 11.8 inches of excess rainfall at the end of July. Um, what happened for us is that we were kind of dry for a while and then between mid-June and mid-July, we received 25 inches of rainfall in about 29 days. Um, it, it was horrible for these heavy clay soils that, that we have here because everything was just saturated. And then we didn't get rain after that for about three months. So as you can imagine, this was pretty problematic for not only my extensive garden, but also the trees growing in my yard. And I had several apple trees that died because of that. So just keep in mind that these wet to dry pendulum swings are very problematic. And it's, it's part of this changing weather pattern that is leading to changing climate in the Midwest. Um, so just keep that in mind that long term, we're probably going to keep dealing with this in the future. And if you're a kid that grew up in the 90s with Garth Brooks, I always sing this to myself whenever I'm looking around and I see trees that are obviously crashing because of root rot issues. Blame it all on my roots. Even Garth Brooks thinks we should uh, change the, the words to the song. But basically, tree roots really need a lot of oxygen in the soil and healthy forest soil is about 50% pore space and about half of that pore space is air and inside the air is oxygen and tree roots need oxygen in order to uh, do their metabolic functions to respire properly. Now the canopy of the tree is instead producing the oxygen, but underground tree roots actually need it. So when we get these big rainfall events where uh, the soil is saturated for 24, 48 or more hours, you end up with stressed roots that can then lead to invasion by root rot pathogens, which then can lead to tree death down the road. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. So when it comes to abiotic issues that we humans have a little bit more influence over, um, these three right here, soil compaction, mechanical injury, and changes in water and sunlight availability are, are some of the more prominent ones. So soil compaction, that's often something that I see occurring when somebody buys a really pretty piece of, of forest or woodland, they want to put a house in it. Um, and they go in and make changes to they want to keep the trees, but they go in, they make changes to what's under the trees, including the soil. And that's really, really hard on established tree roots. It, it compacts the soil. It gets rid of a lot of that pore space and obviously a lot of that air. And so we end up with, with trouble for the trees. Um, and so mechanical injury, whether it's a bulldozer putting a trail through a forest or woodland or um, some kind of sloppy logging injuries, that can open trees up to pests and pathogens as well um, and, and cause problems for them like this, this uh, hen of the woods or chicken of the woods mushroom here that's causing some decay on this tree. And then of course, when we put a road through a forest, we are, even if we're careful, we're still changing the, the way the water flows through that area, um, how much sun is hitting some trees, because we're probably gonna take some trees out and expose their, their neighbors to more sunlight. And all of these things can be really problematic for trees that are um, well-established and have been growing in their own happy little place for several decades or, or maybe even you know, more than a hundred years. So let's move on to biotic issues. Lots of insect borers, native insect borers and defoliators. Um, you know, the borers can be anything from caterpillars to wasp borers, a lot of beetle borers uh, that, that feed on, on trees. Um, defoliators include mostly caterpillars, but maybe some sawflies, which are, are wasps, little tiny stingless wasps. Um, there's also thousands of really interesting leaf and twig galls that occur on, on oak hickory forests, you know, throughout the Midwest. Most of these are just super interesting. They're not damaging to trees for the most part, but there are a few species that will hit trees at an outbreak level and can actually cause some early spring defoliation and other problems. Armillaria root rot, there's at least three species of armillaria that occur um, in our Midwestern forests, maybe more. Um, and some of them are just, they're kind of saprophytic. They're not doing anything too terribly damaging. Um, 
until those trees become weakened and then they're, they're able to attack those roots. And then hypoxylin canker, vascular wilts, typically fungal diseases that will attack the uh, vascular tissues, the water conducting tissues of a tree and hypoxylin canker really falls into that category. And then animal damage, and that can be anything from, from cattle grazing to hogs and squirrels. I don't ask me why squirrels will attack trees the way they do sometimes, um, but I've seen quite a bit of squirrel damage in recent years. Sometimes it's explained because of drought conditions. They don't have anything else to eat, so they'll eat the bark off of trees. Sometimes they're just weird. I don't know why they're doing it. All right, so now that we've taken a dive into what causes just tree stress across the board, let's talk specifically about um, the major issue that I see uh, with with tree with oaks um, and you know oak forests and oak woodlands in Missouri and probably south of here as well and that would be oak decline. Uh, so oak decline, this is a pretty common sight right here. I see this a lot when a landowner says, "Oh, all my oaks are dying. There's some kind of terrible thing ripping through the woods and it's it's killing all my oak trees." And it's it's off, it's more complicated than that, but. Typically what the landowner wants to hear is that, yes, there's some sort of, of pest that is killing your trees and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, sorry. Unfortunately, it's, it's often not that simple um, and there are some things you can do about it and it is a natural process. So it's, sometimes it's not anything we can um, necessarily stop, but it's something that we can know more about and appreciate on a little bit deeper level. So hopefully we can get through that um, here in the next few slides. So oak decline is common in oak forests worldwide. It's, it's not just a, a Midwest thing. It's not just an oak, you know, hickory forest thing. It, oak decline is common in, in uh, the Mediterranean oak ecosystems. Anywhere there's oaks, decline happens. It's very widespread and chronic in Missouri and the lower Midwest. That's just part of, of the story of oak forests. And usually, it follows a severe drought, um, but it may not fully be realized for maybe 10 to 15 years after a severe drought. So we are now almost 10 years past the drought of 2012, and there's still a lot of oaks that are dying. And people say, well, it hasn't really been that droughty recently. Yes, but um, trees grow slow and they tend to die slow. So, so 10 years later is really not that much time for a tree. So there's a couple different ways that oak decline can show up in, in forests. Um, one way is crowns turn brown quickly during the growing season. This is usually the pattern you would think of if trees are going to die during that severe drought or maybe the year following a severe drought. Really what I typically see with oak decline though, and this can be in an urban or a forest woodland situation, um, is this this idea of gradual dieback and then invasion by secondary agents. And so I like this picture because this tree really gives us the opportunity to look at the progression of oak decline over time. So it typically starts out with the appearance of sparse or off color leaves. Um, and it's interesting, I have some cheap sunglasses from Walmart that have just the perfect polarization in them where I can pick out just a sort of off yellow color when I'm looking at a hillside of oaks. And those off yellow trees are typically the ones that are starting down that path of oak decline. And so you get these off color leaves and maybe the next year or so that's gonna lead to some small twig and, and small branch dieback. You're starting to see more twigs visible on the tips of, of branches. And then eventually that's gonna lead to a large branch death. And that's, that's getting pretty serious right there. The tree could basically die at any point um, after these large branches start dying. And a, a lot of times these trees look pretty bushy um, because they're putting out extra sprouts. Um, there's all these hidden buds along the, the trunk and branches of trees. And when they're exposed to sunlight or some other stressor, they tend to pop. And so um, you'll see the tree sort of as a last ditch effort trying to put out some extra leaf mass in order to, to make some carbs and, and try to stay alive. Uh, 
But what's going on underground in the root system is usually our malaria and some root rot issues. And um, this tree is, it's, it's a freight train of decline. It cannot be stopped. It's going downhill. So oak decline factors, those predisposing factors like what we talked about earlier, specifically for oak decline, include a high percentage of red oak group species. Um, so think black, southern red, uh, northern red oaks. Advanced age, once they start hitting 70 to 90 years, they're mature to overmature, and they're, they're probably not going to last much longer just based off of the longevity of the species. Uh, a lot of times, trees that are growing on ridges and upper slopes tend to be more affected than ones that are lower on the hillside, but that's not always the case. Um, as you remember, those widespread frost events can affect those trees on lower slopes more, uh, so it could put them at greater risk because of the stress. And then high stand density. A lot of oak uh, forests in Missouri and, and elsewhere are just not thinned properly. There's no fire anymore. Um, in a lot of places. And so there's really high stand density in a lot of places that just causes a lot of competition between trees. So these inciting factors that are hitting these predisposed trees are these abiotic issues that we talked about, the drought, the late spring frost, various types of storm damage. And then of course the, abi or the biotic factor is the spring defoliation um, by some sort of insect species. And we're lucky in the Midwest in our area and that we don't have Lymerantria dispar, which is the moth formerly called gypsy moth. Um, we, we don't have populations of those in this part of the world. And so therefore we don't have much in the way of spring defoliation uh, besides an occasional outbreak of some native caterpillars. There's a few that if the weather's right, we can, we can get high numbers of those. Um, and then of course, jumping oak gall, which is a teeny tiny wasp in each of those little bitty buttons, uh, button galls on the leaf. And we have had outbreak years of jumping oak gall. In the last 10 years, we've probably had three or four outbreak years. Um, and so these can cause, these galls can cause defoliation on white and post oak early in the growing season, which puts a lot of stress on these trees. And then, of course, the contributing factors when it comes to oak decline, our malaria root rot is a major one, probably the most major one uh, that I'm seeing here recently, hypoxylin canker, and then various uh, borers and, and insects, mostly native species. So it's all part of a big complex that works together to, to take old trees that aren't really serving much purpose anymore, kill them, recycle them, and and make a nice opening in the woods for the new young trees to get some sunlight and grow up. So it, it seems ugly. It seems pretty scary as a human when you're watching this happen, especially if it's on your own property, but this is a very natural and necessary process. So just to review some of these contributing or these um, biotic factors, here's our malaria root rot. Most People are not going to see this mycelial fan stage or the rhizomorph. If you cut firewood, you might see these rhizomorphs under the bark of um, some decayed trees. Honey mushrooms, though, those are, are pretty common. And if the conditions are right, we see the honey mushrooms of the armillaria fungus pop up in the late fall when it's, it's kind of cool and wet. And so if you're seeing honey mushrooms, then yeah, you know armillaria is around. If you're not seeing honey mushrooms, doesn't mean our malaria is not around. Um, in fact, I just sort of tell people that our malaria is everywhere. So just figure on it being a part of the natural ecosystem on your property. Hypoxylin canker is another native that is, is very visible. I'm sure you've all seen this before, whether it's on your property or just driving around. Um, these trees, you see the, the three different colors here. There's sort of the velvety brown, the I call it the silver paint stage, and then there's the basically the black paint stage. So this is all the same hypoxylin uh, fungus. It's just different stages of its life cycle. And so oftentimes you'll get this velvety brown when the tree is being actively killed by hypoxylin. Um, it it kind of looks like it blows the bark off. You'll see bark sort of around the base of the tree where the, the fungal mat, the stroma, um, pushes they push the, the bark off the tree 
um, and then this is racing through the xylem and it, it's it's effectively shutting off the water from the roots to the canopy and the tree's going to die pretty quickly. There's no treatment for it. Um, hypoxylin is a very weak pathogen and so it's within the tree basically its entire life. Probably when that tree was pretty young, it had a wound and some hypoxylin spores entered the tree. But it's not until that tree becomes stressed, until the water potential in its vascular tissues start to drop, um, say during a big drought, that hypoxylin can actually overwhelm it. So in a yard tree, if you water your tree during a drought, you'll keep hypoxylin from taking it over. But in a forest setting, obviously we can't water the forest during a drought. So just something to keep in mind. Reducing competition for water will obviously help um, reduce the amount of hypoxylin that, that occurs. So here's two-line chestnut borer. If any of you are very familiar with insects, you'll see that this is an agrilus, which is in the same genus as the invasive emerald ash borer. Um, but this little native wood boring insect, it's, it's part of the oak decline complex. Um, it's, it's part of killing stress trees and then you know, helping with that recycling process. And then of course, red oak borer, which a lot of you that, like I said earlier, if you split firewood, burn firewood, you've probably seen insect galleries inside oak, much like this, and, and red oak borer is often the culprit. So how do you do, how do you manage oak decline? Um, well, it's kind of tricky. It depends at what stage um, the decline is in on your property, but, the important ideas here are to maintain an appropriate stand density, um, you know, timber stand improvement, thinning, where you go in and you try to reduce competition for when, you know, there is a, a big drought in the future. That will go a long way in, in helping the trees you want to keep stay alive during that big abiotic stress event. Um, if you do see oak declines starting to happen and you're interested in in getting some value out of your timber, then you want to salvage immediately because that hypoxylin canker, if it's able to go through a tree, it pretty much makes that log useless. Um, it, it causes really punky uh, decay in the outer part of the tree and it very quickly starts to break down the tree. So it's something that if oak decline is starting, you, you need to salvage those, those logs immediately to get any value out of them. And then, Generally, if trees have more than 30% crown dieback, they're not coming back from that. Um, there are some situations where a tree may have some limbs die for whatever reason, and then it's able to recover. But by and large, when it comes to oaks, if they start to decline and show that visibly in the crown, even improving environmental conditions aren't going to change the course of um, decline for that tree. And then in some situations when it's really severe, consider a, a wide scale harvest and then regeneration cut, um, the fancy word for basically a clear cut. Seems awful uh, because we've, we've gone through so many decades of um, you know, forestry and, and just public perception of clear cuts being bad. However, sometimes that's what oaks need um, is to sort of start over from the beginning. But every Location is different and working with a professional on a forester on what's best for your specific location is really important. And then of course, promote species diversity. I've, I've been on properties where they've cut out almost everything except white oak, Quercus alba. And then if you put all of your eggs in one basket and something happens to those white oaks, those eggs, then you're in a world of hurt. Um, so it's really important that as we go down this path of, of weather patterns and climate change and whatnot, we focus on maintaining an appropriate species diversity and not just favoring one type of oak or group of oaks over another, because we're probably going to need them all. Remember, oak decline is very slow. And in this particular tree right here, something's been going on for 20 years, at least. Um, it, it looks to me like this oak probably did really well for the first 20, 30 years of its life, and then it sort of reached a wall. It needed to be released. Um, it probably needed to have the trees around it thin so it had more sunlight and um, space to grow, and that didn't happen. And so instead, it basically started down that path of decline. 
And so when you're looking at trees that have died on your property, if you happen to cut those down, pay close attention to those growth rings. And if you see in the last, you know, 10 years that the growth really slowed, then you'll know that 2012 was a big trigger for those trees, um, that they probably did not recover from the 2012 drought. But you may even be able to look back further than that, maybe to the drought of 19, of, you know, early 80s and see that those trees didn't respond very well. I was recently on a property where a lot of white oak was dying. It wasn't very big diameter, um, but what we noticed was that several of these trees were at least 200 years old and only about 14 inches in diameter. So they were growing on a rough site that had had, you know, history of grazing over time. It was really rocky, um, just not ideal growing conditions for Quercus alba, for white oak. Uh, but when we started looking at the rings, it was obvious that they definitely took a nosedive in 2012, but even prior to that, they've been going downhill for a while. So they just kind of reached their limit um, on that site for that species. And there wasn't anything too terribly concerning going on with the site, but trees were starting to die. All right, so I quickly want to go through rapid white oak mortality, which is very different than traditional oak decline, what we just covered. Um, rapid white oak mortality is something that happened mostly in Missouri and probably parts of northern Arkansas. Um, the big event was in 2012, and you think, oh, well, she keeps talking about the drought. It must have been drought. That did play into it, but mortality had been occurring prior to that for a few years. It just wasn't until 2012 that we had a really massive die-off of white oak, um, largely in riparian areas, or at least areas where, where water moves more often. So you can see in this picture from the helicopter, um, it's the low-lying areas, sort of the drainages coming out of this forest where a lot of white oak died. Scattered among the white oak, though, are living uh, red oak group species. So that's what just made it even more intriguing, this phenomenon. So locations uh, are lower slopes, usually not, not what I described with um, the oak decline or red oak mortality where it typically happens a little bit higher on the slope, but lower slopes, drainages, seasonal streams, it's worse on back slopes with a slightly acidic soil. So these soils that were near neutral pH, which is 7.0 on the pH scale, that's where the mortality was the worst. And just to help you understand soils in Missouri, I'm sure a lot of you know that our soils are pretty acidic. Um, and so, you know, white oak, it, it likes pretty acidic soil, 5.2 or, you know, maybe up to 6.0, somewhere in there. So the closer it gets to seven, the more unhappy white oak becomes with that soil situation. And so it, it kind of makes sense that the roots were in these higher soil pHs were probably stressed. Interestingly, we see a lot of chinkapin oak that survives in these areas um, where a chinkapin oak is, is gonna be able to handle a bit higher soil pH. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of playing into the idea that pH does have, have some sort of inf influence on this. Um, and then of course, soils that were more than 30% clay actually had less mortality, which is also interesting because we, if you're a gardener, you know that the more clay you have, it's not always the better for root growth and, and health. And so it's, it's interesting to us that the more clay we had, um, the less mortality, but that could be because clay soils tend to retain water better. And because the particle size is so small, they may prevent the movement of soil-borne pathogens a little bit better. So trees were mostly white oak, Quercus alba, although a few post oaks died and sometimes we'd see red oak group species in these areas too, but it's mostly white oak, um, a wide age range. So anywhere from 45 to 120 years on trees that were cored and examined. It's a, a bit smaller on the DBH um, as far as, you know, how big these trees were. It seemed to affect a smaller age class um, or size class, although big trees were killed and some younger trees were killed. But in a lot of the places that I visited, I would see, I would be standing underneath dead white oaks, larger trees, and there would be living white oak regeneration under my feet. So seedlings and saplings. Um, and then of course, in some places, some white oak, some healthy white oaks remained, which was kind of interesting too. Um, so this was occurring in stands that were both managed and unmanaged. And so it seemed like density was not a factor. So tree density, whereas with 
you'll recall with the traditional oak decline, density is indeed a factor. So we kind of found the, the normal culprits that you would expect, um, ambrosia beetles, two-line chestnut borer. Some of these ambrosia beetles are not native, although we did not find any fungi um, that they could have been bringing that would have been sort of a smoking gun in this situation. Diseases that were found were hypoxylin canker, our malaria root rot, and then this one that's underlined is Phytophthora cinnamomi. It's a kind of a water mold. It's a soil-borne pathogen that has caused a lot of tree mortality in the east because of, of how it affects roots. And so we didn't know how much cinnamomi was maybe traveling in these, um, traveling in water and then causing root damage uh, that was then causing tree death when the soils would dry out. So we don't consider Phytophthora cinnamomi to be the smoking gun in the situation, but we do think it's playing a role. And then of course, there were other known fungi that were found such as Diplodia and Fusarium. The lead researcher on this, she's now in Ontario, but Dr. Sharon Reed at MU um, spent several years researching this issue. So one thing that we know is that in the last 20 plus years, there's been a 35% increase in the number of, of large rainfall events that occur in our state. And because of the Phytophthora cinnamomi and how it moves in water and can affect um, roots that are in saturated situations, we're starting to think that there, there's something going on with the weather, weather patterns that have led to this rapid white oak mortality issue. Um, like I said, we don't fully understand it, but it does seem to, to point to the fact that just these, these wilder weather patterns are contributing to mortality. So here's a, an increasingly intense timeline of rapid white oak mortality in Missouri. Um, you can see that it starts in 2007 with a late spring freeze. And then 2012 there is when we had this really big mortality event. But on either side of 2012, we were seeing and white oaks die and getting reports from the public. Um, but as you move on, you see that, you know, I don't intend for you to digest all of this, but there's just a lot going on with our trees in the last 14 or more years. Um, there's a lot of pendulum swing between we're really wet and then we go really dry and then there's an outbreak of this pest or, you know, a, a couple of years of late spring frost in a row. So there's just a lot of drama going on and it's easy to see how just the right sequence of events could lead to a pretty big mortality event. I have 2022 there in red because I don't know when we might see more white oak mortality. Will we in the future? Probably. Um, but just keep that in mind that if specifically white oaks are dying on your property and it's in these sort of lower slope areas, that, that this situation may be to blame. So tree stress likely plays a role and there's quite a bit of tree stress going on right now. So the myth, all the white oaks are gonna die. Nope, not true, not gonna happen. Um, but it's sort of the same idea of uh, with the traditional oak decline. Harvest when it's appropriate, look for those thinning chlorotic crowns. And if you wanna get some monetary value out of that, salvage it within a year. Um, of course, work to maintain and increase stand vigor and promote species diversity. Um, we really should not be managing just for white oak. We really need to be managing for a lot of oaks, a lot of other hardwoods across the board. Diversity is key for maintaining health uh, for us into the future. All right, so now let's move on to some invasive pests. Just as a general information piece, I wanna say be on the lookout for new pests because they can arrive at any time. For example, emerald ash borer, that was not one that was on any watch list or it was something that, you know, the forest community, the forest health community was looking for. It just sort of came out of nowhere. We do have watch lists. We do have pests that we're looking for and, and we know they're coming or could be coming, but there's a bunch of them that we probably don't even know about. So it's important that um, all of us keep an eye out for things that are, are causing problems in the woods. If you see an insect or something that you don't recognize and you can't find it through Google, I want to know about it. I want to see if it is something that's um, potentially an invasive issue. We 
the earlier we know about a lot of these lo or the locations of these invasive pests, the sooner we can start controlling the spread of that. Um, and in some situations that might mean cutting down trees, but in a lot of situations it would just lead to maybe firewood quarantines or, or some sort of overall awareness of what's going on. So one thing I want you all to keep in mind for this upcoming summer is uh, laurel wilt. We haven't found it in Missouri yet, but it's probably on its way. It's been identified in some of our border counties with Tennessee. Laurel wilt is particularly devastating because it kills species in the laurel family and it very quickly kills sassafras. So it's a fungus that's spread by a teeny tiny ambrosia beetle called the red bay ambrosia beetle. And you know, once it gets to our state, it'll probably spread pretty rapidly through our forests and, and we'll see a lot of sassafras die. Um, in places south of Missouri, you know, in southern Arkansas, it, it's pretty devastating. So please, if you are seeing sassafras die and there's no fire involved, sassafras doesn't like fire, um, do keep in mind that laurel wilt could be the problem. And just a quick review of emerald ash borer. A lot of us have been talking about this for years and many of you are pretty aware. And fortunately, ash is not a huge component of forests and woodlands across uh, the lower Midwest, but it is, it is a species that we see in a lot of riparian areas and um, urban areas. So just keep in mind that emerald ash borer is rapidly spreading across Missouri and also Southern Arkansas, um, Kansas, Oklahoma, be prepared, it's coming. Once it gets to an area, it, it starts to spread pretty quickly. It's not a pest that we can really um, control long-term like some of the other ones. So here you can just see it, it's spread all across our state. I suspect a lot of our um, the counties that are white will be colored in in the next year or so. So one good way to detect emerald ash borer in an area is to look for bark blonding uh, caused by woodpeckers because the woodpeckers know those trees are really infested and they just start going to town on them, especially in winter. Um, and so you'll see these, these ash that look kind of naked and that's because of, of the bark blonding. So this is all related to emerald ash borer infestation. Basically, there's not much we can do. Um, insecticides aren't practical in forest situations, although in yard situations, that's a different story. And in a lot of cases, ash is going to disappear from places, although it probably will never be completely extirpated um, from the whole state. So what I tell people is manage ash the same way you would if EAB were not part of the equation. If you want to um, cut it out for timber stand improvement purposes, do that. If you don't, then leave it. Um, trees that are over 10 inches in diameter will probably be killed. And so what we'll see with ash is sort of like elm. It'll be a much smaller tree that sort of survives, survives on the landscape. Uh, it just won't get very big. And so if you do have big trees on your property that have been through the first wave of emerald ash borer and have not been killed, we might consider those lingering ash. And that's something we'd want to know about because they could potentially be really valuable in breeding resistant ash trees down the road. There are biological control species that are being released to um, help, you know, manage the emerald ash borer issue. And in some places, it does work quite well, especially on younger trees. Uh, but this is not the, the silver bullet that's going to save all of our ash. All right. So remember with these emerald ash borer infested ash trees, they are very brittle and very dangerous. And they're basically like giant styrofoam cups. And so as soon as you start to cut one of them down, they tend to shatter and the big limbs break and bonk you in the head. So be very, very careful around these trees. Typically after death, within just a few years, they will fall to the forest floor of their own accord and be recycled. And that's, that's what's most ideal for everybody. And I, I couldn't have a presentation like this without talking about a, invasive plants. And so many of you that are involved with Prairie Foundation and Grow Native, you know how bad invasive plants are. Um, and in a forest and woodland ecosystem, they're terrible. They are highly competitive. They certainly prevent regeneration of your tree species. And they're just disrupting those ecosystem processes. And as we learn more and more about the damage that invasive plants cause, it becomes more and more clear that we, we've got to do something to, to fight them, particularly if you're gonna do a harvest, um, because 
invasive plants can outcompete any regeneration that you may want with your trees. So invasive plant management is very critical in a closed canopy or even a more open woodland canopy situation. And then of course, feral hogs. I hope that as a landowner, if you're in a, a feral hog area that you're willing to help eradicate um, these, these critters because I've been in the woods and seen the damage that they can do and it, it's pretty scary. It takes many, many, many decades probably for, for forest soil to recover um, after feral hogs have been around for a while. So, so getting rid of them and keeping them gone is ideal. And don't forget about grazing. Like I mentioned earlier, that forest grazing by domestic animals is, is a lot of soil compaction, a lot of damage on forests. So just know forests need management. Consult with a professional forester with uh, Missouri Department of Conservation. We've got the Call Before You Cut program, but check with your state to see what free services they can offer. Make a plan based on your goals for your property, but also keep in mind the site factors. There's some things we just can't change. So if you have thin rocky soil, then plan for it. Not every acre is gonna support super valuable white oak uh, veneer quality, stave quality logs. So um, just, just keep that in mind. And one good tip I've learned recently is when you're doing management, take photos and then be patient and look back at those photos every couple of years and realize that the management you're doing is really improving your situation. So increase that tree vigor, maintain appropriate sand density, um, do thinning, prescribed fire, whatever it takes to get to the right number of stems and your forester that you work with can help you with that. Promote that diversity and reduce that stress, particularly that human caused stress. And of course, be on the lookout for invasive species and report um, if you see something new or, or something different. Prescribed fire and TSI, these are our major management tools going into the future. And this is probably what's gonna help us um, down the road with, with climate change issues in the next hundred years is making sure that we are managing forests because they've been sort of deprived of some of these natural processes that would have managed them prior to human settlement. And I, I have to have a soapbox here right at the end. What I've come to learn with working with landowners recently is that it's important that you love the forest that you have or the woodland or whatever. This tree right here is over 250 years old. It's a post oak that just looks like garbage. But you know what? This is a really, really cool tree. And the trees around it were really cool too. But I can see how a, a new landowner might look at this and say, oh, this is terrible. How can I improve this? But once you start to learn more about it and the ecosystem functions that these old trees or new trees or whatever the case is on your property have, I think you start to love it a little more. And so just learn as much as you can about uh, the piece of property that you own and, and try to do the best you can to manage it properly um, for the future. And then remember, dead trees are important too. So we often see a dead tree as just a tragedy, but dead trees are full of life. I know that's the cheesiest thing I could have said, but it's true. There's a lot of animals um, that rely on dead trees, just lots of insects, lots of fungi. So dead trees are super duper important. All right, we do have tree health resources available on the Conservation Department website. And with that, Carol, give me some questions. Thank you, Robbie, that was excellent. We do have a lot of questions and okay. we will get through as many of these as, as you have time for. Um, Robbie sure. was kind enough and generous to uh, let us know earlier that she put her contact information on the slide that you see in front of you so that if we are not able to get to your question, um, you are welcome to contact Robbie. So um, there was a question somebody had right just a second ago asking what TSI means. That stands for Timber Stand Improvement. Uh, yes. I started to answer that question and then uh, we uh, behind the scenes, but uh, we didn't get to it. Um, so, okay, let me try to take these questions. Uh, there were a number of questions about how do you know um, what the appropriate stand density is for Missouri woodlands or forests. And I suppose that's gonna depend on the species type area of the state and what your goals are, but could you speak a bit more about appropriate stand density? 
Yeah, so that's going to be based off of, of site factors and conditions, and it's it's going to vary. So I suggest working with either a conservation department forester, if you live here in Missouri, or consulting forester, um, somebody with a forest management background that, that knows how to take all those site conditions and put it together and look at the the stocking ratios and everything else that goes with forest management and say, yep, there should be this many stems per acre on in this general area. Um, and so, you know, I'm the insect and disease specialist. That management side is not necessarily what I do, but that's what you need in order to know um, what your stand density should be for your forest type, for your soil type. Thank you. Um, there's another question about um, from David. He says, I have a stand of mature white oaks with little or no oak regeneration. I'm concerned if I remove these oaks to encourage regeneration, that autumn olive, olive and bush honeysuckle, which of course are non-native invasive, um, and they are present in his area, he's afraid that they will be released and really increase their vigor and they'll become dominant. What would you suggest? Right. Yeah, that's a really tricky situation. And it's something that a lot of um, landowners are facing right now. And so, you know, a recent experience I had with a private landowner, the suggestion was, and this isn't possible everywhere, but um, was to run fire through that for a few years to sort of encourage that oak regeneration. Um, so fire, oaks are fire adapted, and they will be, you know, they will be spurred on by by that fire if you're able to do that in your area. Um, you know, you could also work with a forester to figure out a, a harvest plan where maybe you, you harvest uh, some patches of trees instead of just harvesting it all at once and seeing what happens and the invasives take over, maybe you do it in more reasonable bites. Um, so just th there's options out there, but having a professional forester on the ground would would really help you to figure out what the best um, course of action is there. Thank you. There is at least one question here about um, invasive plants, uh, winter creeper, which is a euonymus species, how mm -hmm. to best eliminate or control runaway winter creeper. Um, and I would like to hear what Robbie's going to say, but also I wanted to let everybody know that you can find um, invasive plant identification and control resources with the Missouri Department of Conservation's website and also the Missouri In Invasive Plant Council, which is administered through the Grow Native program. You can find a lot of resources there. So I'm sure I, I mentioned this because no doubt others of you have invasive plant control questions and we may not be able to address those. But in terms of winter creeper, um, and for those of you who are not familiar, this is a, a non-native vine with really waxy leaves that it's pretty difficult to eradicate. It's a ground cover, but then it can climb up trees. And once it gets up and has more light, it will flower and set fruit. And then it can spread from there as well. Any tips, Robbie, on its control? So invasive plants are not technically part of my program. So Carol, you're going to know better about um, winter <laughs> creeper control than I would. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned those resources because there, there is a lot of information out there on invasive plant control in general. So make sure, and, and this is the case with diseases and insects on trees too. If you're trying to control or manage something, your timing often has to be very specific and in the application of whatever specific chemical works. And so I would just say, make sure you're not just picking up the first thing you can find at the farm store and, and throwing an herbicide at it. Do a little bit of reading and figure out the timing of that specific herbicide and, and what works best. Thanks, Robbie, and my apologies. I th you're so knowledgeable about so many things, but of course <laughs> you are first and foremost a forest entomologist. And in that right. regard, we also have a number of questions about invasive insects um, uh, related to, to what you presented. So I'll just go through those questions. To whom would um, people report emerald ash war sightings to? Or yeah, so you can email me directly, or we also have a forest health um, MDC email address. But you know what? I run that email address, so 
just email me. <laughs> and if it's in a county where we have not confirmed it in Missouri, then that's something where I'd come out and do a site visit and, and take samples. Um, but if we've already confirmed your county and you just want to send me your location so I can add it to the map, that's great. Uh, but you're not obligated to report if we've already confirmed your county. Thank you. Here's another question. We've had what may be oak wilt killing a number of red oak species very quickly this year. Should those trees be burned for firewood to decrease spread? If they're left to be standing deadwood in the forest, will they add to additional tree loss? I wondered if an oak wilt question would come up and I'm glad it did. I had taken those um, slides out of my show because oak wilt is something that we're concerned about in this area, but it's not something that just wrecks the forest the way it does in in the northern oak areas and then in like Texas where there's live oak. Um, we typically see oak wilt pockets sort of burn themselves out over the course of a few years. So that oak wilt is spreading underground between trees that are, are root grafted. So that's generally the same species of tree will will root graft with you know it, itself. Um, so if you have a black oak, it'll be root grafted to a black oak, but it's probably not root grafted to a northern red oak next to it. Um, although there are some exceptions there. But as far as burning goes, um, I would say now's the time to cut a tree that you know has oak wilt. Um, cut it, split it, and then put a tarp over it and make sure that the edges of that tarp are entirely covered with soil or blocks or something so that if that that split firewood um, does produce some kind of oak wilt spore mats, the insects that can spread this to new trees uh, won't won't be able to access it. So if you're not a firewood burner, you're not going to split it, you could just drop those trees and kind of chunk them up and that would hopefully help them to dry out enough that they won't produce spore mats next spring. Uh, but really, to be honest with you, because of the way it behaves in Missouri forests, I, I'm not sure I would be terribly worried about it if I were you, if this is just a forest setting. Um, if this is your yard, that's, that's something totally different. But if it's a forest setting, you could probably get away with just letting it go. Um, and it probably will not cause that many more issues down the road. You're welcome to call me and we can talk about your site more specifically because there's a lot of factors that go into, into this windy explanation. Thank you. In regard to laurel wilt, is there anything that can be done to stop or slow it down? Um, this is from yeah. John. He loves his sassafras and he'd hate to lose them as any of us would. Any I know. Um, so at this point, we don't know of anything um, that will slow it down. So the beetle is quite tiny and it, it probably doesn't fly very well. And in a lot of cases where it's popped up in the Southeastern US, um, we don't really know how it's, it's moving around. Uh, we don't know if it's moving in laurel based firewood or, or what's going on there. It could be it's being blown around by the wind, um, which sounds crazy, but some of these these insects are very mobile with the winds. Um, so as far as research into controlling uh, the disease progression, it, there's not a lot going on with forest trees. Now, avocado is a laurel and of course it, it's killed by laurel wilt. So there's, there's a lot of research with that specific species um, and they do inject uh, propiconazole, which is a fungicide. Um, and so that could slow it down. Um, but once a tree, has laurel wilt, it's, it's the end of it. Um, so keeping it out of Missouri for whatever means we can is, is the most important thing at this point. Thank you. And it is concerning too when we think about the whole food chain and insects whose larvae may feed on the leaves of say the ash or, or, or yep. uh, 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 sassafras. It's not just the tree but it's everything that tree is supporting. So it is concerning, yeah. of course, the larvae of the, so many of those insects are food for birds. And so um, absolutely, there are many reasons to be on the lookout. Um, right. An, another question, is there a way to differentiate between general oak decline and oak wilt? Uh, yes, usually. So when it comes to oak 
wilt, it's, it's typically a very distinct progression. Okay, so um, my experience is with oak wilt and forested situations, it often comes after the power line company prunes, um, usually between say the beginning of March through sometime in June. If trees are wounded, this basically red oak group trees are the, the most susceptible ones to oak wilt. If they're wounded during that spring, early summer time period, when the beetles that can carry the spores of oak wilt are active, then that's when you can get this, this transmission of oak wilt um, to new locations. And so, you know, if, if you've seen, it seems like trees are healthy and then there was some sort of big storm or a power line pruning and all of a sudden there's trees in that, that area that were wounded that are suddenly dying, they're losing their leaves in July rapidly then that's an indication that, yeah, oak wilt is, is probably at play here versus oak decline. Like I described earlier, oak decline is usually a much, much slower situation. It takes several years. Um, an oak wilt tree is going to die in six weeks. It, it's not going to last very long once it's infected. And so if you have this slow, slow decline, then probably oak decline is what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Curtis says, I've seen, quote, blonding on my property. Should I be concerned? And to whom should I report this? So you can email me if you're in Missouri. Um, if you're in one of the other states, then I can probably hook you up with your forest health specialist. Um, but yeah, if you're in Missouri, go ahead and send me your location. and I'd be happy to put it on the map. But if you're seeing blonding on ash, 99% chance that emerald ash borer is the reason for the blonding. Um, so, yep, yeah, just, just send me a report if you'd like. Thank you. And Mike has a question, um, maybe if you could clarify. He says, I'm surprised to hear that emerald ash borer can't be controlled with insecticides. Do you also include the injected insecticides? So I, I think I mentioned this when I was talking. At a forest level, it cannot be um, controlled with insecticides. Yard trees are a different story. So there are some really effective insecticides, particularly imamectin and, ben imamectin benzoate injected into the trunk of that tree that will protect it um, from emerald ash borers. So, you know, you, you can protect a high value ash tree in your yard so long as you get it treated before there's been too much damage done by the pest. Um, but when you're talking about forest level, it's just not practical. You know, we're, it's about $10 per diameter inch to inject a tree. So, you know, it, a 20 inch tree is going to be $200. And when you're looking at the forest level, it's just, it, it's not going to work. Um, and there are other insecticides that are used with pest management, different types of pests um, in Eastern forests, particularly hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and the, some of those insecticides do work for ash and they're much more affordable, but they're neonicotinoids and they also have um, concerns with, with runoff into water situations and things like that. So I just usually say in Missouri, it is not practical to think about treating forest ash growing in the forest with insecticides. Thank you. Uh, Steven says, it can be difficult to spot trees with root rot problems. Any tips on spotting trees that, can, that may become a hazard? Yep. So if that tree is in your yard or near your house and you see it fairly frequently, just keep an eye out for mushrooms that are coming, you know, out of the trunk or down near ground level or maybe kind of popping up randomly in the yard um, because those mushrooms could be coming off of major roots. And sometimes they're an indication, you know, some mushrooms don't have anything to do with, with tree rot, um, but some of them do. And so it's important to get those identified. Um, the Missouri Mycological Society can identify mushrooms for you. Facebook groups, there may be some value in posting a picture there to see if you can get a correct ID. Um, I do some mushroom ID if they're coming off of trees or roots. Uh, so, you know, keeping an eye out for those mushrooms are often very fleeting, um, but keeping an eye out, taking a picture and then getting them identified can give you an idea if root rot is happening. Also, when trees start to, to show that decline, um, you know, where the the branches are starting to die back. 
it's typically not because something is happening in the canopy. It's typically because something is happening in the root system. And so um, I don't want to say the root system is a direct reflection of the canopy, but the root system controls to some extent what's going on in the canopy and vice versa. And so when you start to get root rot advancing in a tree, oftentimes you do see that pretty distinct decline occurring. And that's a good indication that, that there's something wrong in the root system. Thank you. Um, in regard to reporting um, insect sightings, you mentioned uh, that folks can contact you in regard to emerald ash borer. What about other, can they report all, any kind of invasive insect sighting to you or are there other uh, watch lists? Yeah, so um, a lot of people will report strange things to our Ask MDC email address, which is just askmdc at mdc.mo.gov. Um, and so that's one way that, you know, you, if you want something identified, we'll identify it for you. You can also use iNaturalist, and there are a lot of professionals that keep an eye on iNaturalist. And so there's been several pests. Um, found in new locations because somebody who doesn't know what they're taking a picture of takes a picture, uploads it, and then somebody who don't does know what they're looking at is able to identify it and say, oh my gosh, let's look into this further. Um, so that that app in particular is, is pretty useful um, if you can't or don't want to report it to the conservation department. But the USDA has some people that you could report to and Missouri Department of Ag does as well, but typically in Missouri, it's the conservation department that you send stuff to. Thank you. A, a few questions here on stressors and climate. Um, and Linda has a very practical question. Are there, do you have recommendations for watering mature trees during drought periods? And I, I think she means, you know, maybe in a yard setting. Yeah. You know, kind of yep. Great question. Um, my general recommendation is 10 gallons of water per inch of diameter. So, you know, it's really not that much water um, if you think about it from that perspective. And you want to do that every two to three weeks during a drought. Take the sprinkler off your hose, take the end off your hose, and just set that hose at two gallons per minute and let it trickle throughout the root system. So, you know, if you do two gallons per minute, it's easy to figure out how many minutes you need to run the hose to get to your desired number of gallons. And then you can sort of move the hose throughout the, the drip line of that tree um, over the course of the 180 minutes you need or whatever it is. And so if you do that, you're, you're actually going to probably save a mature tree during a drought. It's, it's, really good way to keep hypoxylin at bay and, and keep that tree alive. You can overwater trees. So that's why I say keep to 10 gallons um, per diameter inch. And if you're talking about pine, you need to do about five gallons or some kind of evergreen. You need to do about half that because they're more sensitive to uh, being overwatered. And let's see, can't think of anything else in that realm, but yeah, watering is very important. 10 gallons per diameter inch. Excellent advice. Um, earlier, when you were talking about changing climatic patterns and drought, um, someone mentioned this does not bode well for trying to mitigate climate change by planting additional trees. And we do hear a lot about efforts around the world to plant trees expressly for the purpose of storing carbon. That is, the trees are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, storing them in the, in the plant matter. And this is apps, and in some cases it is a good idea, and in other cases trees are being planted for carbon storage, where really herbaceous plants would do better because of changing climate and because of soils and so forth. And uh, I just wanted to mention that we have a forthcoming article about prairie and grasslands and carbon storage in the forthcoming issue of the Missouri Prairie Journal, so you might watch for more information about that. Um, yeah, and, and that's an excellent point, Carol. I'm really glad you brought that up because trees don't belong everywhere. They, I love trees, but they don't belong everywhere. And we need to be more deliberate about how and what we plant in the future. Um, because if, if you're looking at, at planting a species that should live 80 to 120 years, 
right now we need to be making the right choice. And unfortunately it's kind of difficult because we don't exactly know which way this is gonna go. There's several scenarios based off of different emission levels. Um, and in some scenarios, certain tree species win. In other scenarios, certain tree species lose. It, it just kind of depends on where we actually go with climate change. If we get drier during the fall or if we get wetter um, and uh, you know, white oak and sugar maple, it doesn't really matter what scenario you're looking at, they pretty much lose no matter what. Um, so just kind of generic support your post oak, your bur oak, um, you know, walnut, some of those species, if you're only planting one or two trees, you probably ought to be thinking about something like that instead of, of some of these red oak species or, or white oak. Thank you. Um, there's a, a question from Linda about who, who is doing oak ring research in Missouri and to whom could we send photos of tree rings? And Robbie, you may know the answer to that, but I did also want to just mention that that person might be Dr. Mike Stambaugh with the University of Missouri, and he's going to be doing um, a Grow Native webinar for us March 16th on fire history and looking at tree rings and dendrochronology to determine fire history. So I just wanted to mention that um, we don't have registration set up for that yet, but those of you in uh, on live with us now may, may enjoy that. But Robbie, I don't yes. know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, yeah. And so Mike Samba is the guy. Um, he's the one that does that type of work in Missouri. And he was the one that I was on the field visit with last week where we saw the 200 year old tree uh, that had quite a few fire scars in it, interestingly enough. So yep, um, Mike is with University of Missouri. You can just search his name, Stambaugh, S-T-A-M-B-A-U-G-H, and uh, you'll find his contact information. He's pretty busy and sometimes it takes him a while to get back if you email him, um, but he is incredibly knowledgeable and has a lot of interesting things to say about uh, Missouri trees and well, just trees across the US. He's done a lot of research and, and what the dendrochronology can tell us. It's more than just counting rings. There are so many interesting things that come from um, the analysis that, that they can do nowadays, the microanalysis. Thank you. Um, we're, we're getting on here a bit, but I will uh, try to get through a, a few more questions as you have time, Robbie. Um, sure. Someone mentioned, Robbie, wondering if you have heard of the ecosystem health mapping tool known as the recovery wheel. This uses a variety of inputs to determine the health of the ecosystem. And the website is sarahaustralasia.com wheel. Yeah, I saw that pop up in the chat and I'm not familiar with with that specifically. So I'm interested to um, visit that link here in a little bit and see see what it's all about. So thank you for posting that, Joe. Thanks. Um, uh, Damon has a question about, you know, he's taking care of the trees on his property, but he sees invasives, maybe some tree health issues on his neighbors or elsewhere in his community. And I suppose this is more of a, maybe a community conservation issue. Do you have tips for how people can um, broach the topic with their neighbors or with their community about how important tree, forest, woodland health is and invasive plant control is? Uh, I'd like to see if you have some, some thoughts to share. Yeah, that's an awesome question that I wish I had a good answer for. Um, it can be really tricky, but ideally we do want to try to manage um, forests and woodlands at a landscape level, you know, more than just our own property boundaries. And especially when you're talking about invasive plant species um, and feral hogs, that sort of thing, you really need several people cooperating and with the same goals in order to make a difference in your area. Um, so if you know your neighbors, um, Try to have that conversation with them. Start out sort of, this is my, the way I um, start out with landowners. I try to, to get to know what they're interested in. I do a lot more listening and question asking than I do talking. And so I think it helps to see what their goals are, kind of what they know, if they're very aware of, of the tree and forest health issues on their own property. And then just Kind of slowly over time, you have to work your way up to uh, doing more exciting things. But 
people will also gravitate towards that landowner that is making a difference on their own property. So if you just really start managing your location and and showing people how great it can be, I wouldn't be surprised if your neighbors get on board, um, if they're able. A lot of this is pretty physical, this management, so it can be kind of hard to get people to buy into it. Um, but there are cost share programs. If physically they can't do the work, they could potentially be part of, of different cost share and, and get that work partially paid for. So there's lots of different ways to go about it. But here in Missouri, we have with the conservation department, we have a group of people uh, called private land conservationists in addition to our private land foresters that can offer you free advice and site visits and meet with neighbors and, and help everybody get on board with, with doing some active management. So um, I would say contact your, your local private land conservationist too. Thank you. Uh, just trying to get through a couple more questions. Do you know what's leading to the decline of deaths of post oaks around South Kansas City? Uh, I don't specifically. That's that's an interesting question. I have seen a couple of post oaks die or pictures of dead post oaks in that area, but I have not um, had enough reports to think that there's something major going on. I do know that post oak has taken a hit in South Arkansas and sort of East Texas, and they're thinking that it's, it's related to a Phytophthora, um, which is a root rot. So it's possible that that is, you know, also occurring in Kansas City. Um, I'd be interested to know how old these trees are, if I could find our malaria on them, um, kind of how they've been growing in the last several decades, if they're experiencing a lot of uh, human stressors, soil compaction. I mean, what I find is that on each of these sites, there's usually a unique set of circumstances that leads up to tree death. And sometimes I can't even figure out what all those things are. Um, so, you know, I just need more information. So if you want to send me an email and, and some sites, I'd be happy to look into it more. Thanks. Um, regarding using the emerald ash borer insecticides, um, so let's say on an ash tree on your property, would it affect woodpeckers that feed on those wood you know, wood boring insects? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the answer really is no, because um, for example, imamectin benzoate, if it is properly translocated throughout the tree, it's gonna kill anything that tries to eat that tree, basically anything. And so there's not going to be any live insects for the woodpeckers to eat. So therefore they are not going to come into contact with imamectin benzoate. Um, so, so that's one thing to keep in mind is that an insecticide kills insects and woodpeckers like live insects. Very good. Another uh, question, Linda, and uh, how are oak decline factors related to the decline of bird predators? Oak decline related to the decline of bird predators? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if she means predators of birds or if she means birds that are predators. If you're mm -hmm. on, Linda, maybe you could clarify. Um, yeah, so sort of oak decline leading to dead trees, and I'm not really sure where to go with that question. Um, yeah, I'm not either. Maybe we'll go some on some clarification. And, yeah, maybe we'll see if Linda's on. She can provide some clarification, and we'll go on to another okay. question. Um, um, what a, there's a question here about hickories. Are hickories being affected by drought and other stressors? Yes, I, I think so. Um, hickory tends to be very sensitive to uh, changes, environmental changes. So they're very sensitive to compaction and, um, you know, those more human caused abiotic issues. Uh, but hickory can be very sensitive to drought. And then especially if we go from drought to overly wet, they don't particularly care for that either. And so shagbark, uh, bitternut, there's even a, a hickory decline complex described in the northern states um, on bitternut hickory. We don't really see that in Missouri, but it's it's certainly something to keep in mind that when you have um, hickories declining in an area, it's it's similar to oak decline. It's probably a bunch of things working together, um, incited by some abiotic conditions to to kill those trees. Thank you. 
Uh, Mary had a really good point that that watering information you gave during a drought was so excellent. I was trying to write it down myself. I didn't get it all. Robbie, would you mind emailing that to me? And we could include that sure. in the email that goes out to everybody tomorrow. Um, okay. That would be great. Yep. Um, yep. I would I'm be happy to. Okay, great. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to end now. But um, thanks, everyone, for your great questions. And as Robbie said, she's happy to um, uh, receive your emails if we did not, uh, we weren't able to address your questions today. Um, do watch for an email sometime tomorrow with a link to the recording of the webinar today, along with some resources that Robbie mentioned and, and some other, other things that you may find of interest. And Robbie, wonderful presentation. Lots of kudos to you in the chat and the Q&A. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation with excellent information. Well, I appreciate the invite and thank you to everyone who stayed on this long. Well, we still have 156 people on, so. Wow. <laughs> yes. Thanks I'm again. glad you didn't tell me that before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we had a lot more earlier on, but still here at almost 530, still 150 people. So um, thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you, Robbie. Everyone have a safe and enjoyable evening. Goodbye. Thank you.